Hey, this is uh, Jay Horowitz with the latest edition of Amazing Mets Alumni Podcast, and my special guest this week is Frank Viola, or as his friends just call him, Sweet Music. Frank was a big harmonica player in college. Frank, listen, I don't want to start off on a negative note, but I got some intel on you I got to share with you. Right out of the gate? Right out of the gate, Frank. (laughs) Suppose when you were saying, John, there's a fight with New York Tech that you started, that you started, Frank? And supposedly you didn't take any part in that fight. Could you kind of want to defend yourself a little bit? I can't. I can't. Yeah. What happened was I just got back. I had just gotten back from Japan for a Team USA uh, event. And it was my first fall start against New York Tech. And New York Tech and St. John's did not like each other. Long story short, ninth inning or bottom of the eighth inning, New York Tech scored a run, ended up beating us 3-2. to two. Game ended. And as I was walking off the field, New York Tech, you had to go to the parking lot. And it was behind the left field fence. So going past the New York Tech dugout, past third base, I was going to meet my dad to go in the car to leave. And, a, and it is the true story, and I don't know who told you, Mr. Franco. Uh, you, I think uh, I have an idea. Me exactly, but Mr. Franco. No, I don't know. What was your anyway, sources? A ball, got thrown, a ball got thrown at me from the New York Tech dugout uh, for whatever reason, and I picked it up and just threw it back because I didn't want to start anything. Next time I turned around at the fence in left field, there's two teams – Josh, I mean, just brawling in the middle of the field. And I looked at my dad. I said, should I go back? And, and I said, no, the heck with it. And I went in the car and I left. And I don't know what happened after that. There was a little bit of a fight. It was a and yet, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm one to speak. I'm not a great driver. I'm a terrible driver, you know. But somebody told me, you know, the same guy, the same story. He went back to car to a tree. Christ almighty. What, this is not a way to start a conversation, Mr. <laughs> Horowitz. Yeah, you do not... For anybody out there, I, I would not try this if I were you. Do not go backwards 40 miles an hour late night because things get in your way. Yeah, I, I had a tree in my trunk for a couple of weeks until my dad found out about it. And, boy, you talk about getting hell. Oh. Well, it, it, it just to show, I'm, I'm, my, my, it's true, uh, my, my part, I stayed over at uh, – we're talking about Johnny Franco, of course, your teammate, St. John. I stayed at his That's house. Surprising. And I and I got lost, and I backed into a tree, and really disassembled my whole back of my car. Johnny, let me forget that. Oh, I mean, first of all, what was it like to have be with Johnny's teammate for four years at St. John's? It was the best. You talk about a guy that can keep you loose. I mean, there was, there was a reason why when he got to the Mets, he became captain of the Mets. You know, yes, he did his job on the field. Yes, he was a one of the game's greatest closers. But what he had more than anything was true leadership qualities. And by that, Jay, I mean, you don't have to lead by uh, being loud, being obnoxious. You just have to lead by doing the right thing, saying the right things at the right time when the team needs it the most. And he just had a knack of doing that. And we saw that from our earliest days in St. John's. I mean, he and I came in together at St. John's. And St. John's, first of all, they opened their arms to us. I, I mean, we got caught launch there. We were given the ball every fifth day, right from the moment we got on campus, which was pretty special because we had an older team. So they treated us well, and, and in, in, you know, turnaround in fair play is we respected the heck out of them, and I think the mutual respect for each other just grew, and that's how we got to the College World Series, and I believe we're the last St. John's team to get to the College right. World Series. So Johnny, and the, and the shame of it, Jay, of the whole thing is we get to the College World Series, and Johnny couldn't pitch in it because he had a bad shoulder. Yep. I really believe we could have won that if Johnny was healthy. Did he used to torment you, Frank, at all? Johnny? Yeah. yeah. Um, no. Every um, day I took a step, I was getting abused. Every step I took, I got abused from Johnny. Okay, okay, uh, from the first day I got to St. John's to when he got traded over to the Mets and I got over to the Mets, I, 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 had, I couldn't breathe without being ragged okay, by John Franco. Okay, I, I, I could write a book about what he did to me. Let me tell you one story I can tell. We're in the old Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. Uh, Johnny unscrews the horse head from the lobby, gets the keys to my room, opens my room, puts the horse head on my bed, puts ketchup on the pillow, turns the light on in my room. When I walked to the room, I saw that dead freaking horse in my room. <laughs> but that was he, I, that's the, the clean stuff I could tell you. Yeah, but he oh, was yeah, great. Johnny used to say if they, you know, it was great. He was a good friend. Uh, May 21st, 1981, uh, St. John's uh, at Yale. Yale Field, probably before he got to the major, that's regarded as the uh, probably the best college baseball game of all time. Do you feel guilty in a way that Ron Darling didn't get the win? The guy pitches 11 shutout, didn't he? And you get a win that day? Give him oh, a absolutely, absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. No, you don't feel guilty the at Ryan, all? The hell with Ryan Darling. You don't he feel not at all guilty. He got his 11 innings and no hit ball. He got his kudos. No, I, honestly, Jay, to this day, and I'm 60 years old now, and I've seen a lot of baseball from eight, eight, from eight years old to 60 years old to this day, and I've seen no hitters. I've seen almost perfect games. I saw David Cohen track out 20 Phillies. But to this day, it was the best pitch game I have ever seen anybody throw from the first pitch to the 12th inning after he completed his one nothing loss. It was just mind-boggling. When your third hitter in the lineup in the first inning comes back in the dugout and goes, it is the nastiest stuff I have ever seen in my life. That's telling you how, what kind of stuff played. In, and that's a Yale guy of all things. Yeah. You know, pretty yeah. impressive stuff. And, and he, he won in on a botched rundown play, if I remember correctly. And he messed right? up. Yeah, it was a yeah. first and third double steal, and Ronnie was supposed to get it on the mound from the catcher, and he slipped, and it went over his head, and we scored the run. Here's the kicker about Ron Dolly and what kind of an athlete he was there, Jake. So we go out there the next day. They're playing in the loser's bracket game. He just threw 12 innings, around 200 pitches, and uh, they have to play first game in the morning at 10 o'clock. Well, we get there for the 1 o'clock game in around the fifth inning, and I look out there, and now I can't even wipe my butt the next day, and I threw around 150 pitches. And Ronnie's playing right field. And it just so happened that we were sitting down to relax before BP. A ball sits to the warning track in right field with the man on third base. That son of a gun caught the ball into a one hopper to the catcher. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm looking at my teammates, and my te teammates are going, and you have a sore arm, stop it. Yeah. Uh, that was, and that was the great Roger Kahn uh, uh, wrote an article. I mean, Roger Ames, I'm sorry, wrote an article about that. It's a, a historical article. And I guess we got to be teammates later on. It was always a subject of conversation with you guys, right? And later on. I mean, that, that, that's where our friendship started. I mean, we didn't know each other from a hole in the wall till that game. And then our friendship, our friendship grew from there. And then we became teammates. You know, we got even closer. So, you know, it's amazing how baseball, uh, you know, people, people say, do you miss the game? I don't miss the game per se, but I miss the, and you would understand this, you miss the clubhouse, you miss the camaraderie, yeah, you miss no the question. friendships you form, no the, question. the stuff that you can't tell to just anybody because they won't believe some of the stories that you can tell. Yeah, I, I hear. Frank, let me bypass your, your career for a second. After you're done, we were done playing, you, you coached for us, for us, Brooklyn, Savannah, Las Vegas. You were, you were did you really? You had Jacob Degrom in Vegas, right? Yes. Did you expect what was going to happen? It was going to happen when you had him as a as a pitching coach. Absolutely, and I'll tell you when it started. Uh, he came to the Mets, and at the end of his signing, first first year signing, he blew his arm out and had Tommy John surgery. Uh, he rehabbed the following spring, and that year I was pitching coach in Savannah. And around a month and a half into the season, he got shipped out to Savannah on his rehab assignment. He started his career. Well, he, his, his first game, he had a 75-pitch limit, and he struck out like 11 guys, gave up two hits and 75 pitches, and went seven innings. Anyway, he had a couple of good strong starts, and then one day he was doing a side session, and he looked at me. He goes, am I doing the right thing here? He says, I'm 23 years old. I'm in low A ball. Should I be playing baseball? And, you know, I don't, I, I don't blow smoke up my butt very often, Jay, but I looked at him, and I said, you know what? Here's, this, here's the story, Jacob. When you get to the big leagues next year, all I ask of you is leave me one ticket so I can watch your first game in the bigs. And he got to the big leagues in the following year, and look what his career has done since. I mean, you know, being a shortstop and not being a pitcher your whole career, it, you know, once the, the Tommy John got taken care of, he has so many more pitches in that arm. And it's, you know, at 30-plus years old, it's getting livelier and livelier. It is just so much fun to wait and see him pitch every fifth day. It's just a pleasure, pleasure to watch. You know what I liked about him from is being a PR guy with him. All he cared about was pitching, and he would lose so many one nothing games, two nothing games. Never would complain. Never would throw his teammates under the bus. It was always, you know, I should have pitched a shot out. I mean, that's remarkable for a young guy. Never once, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's another Cy Young in his future, hopefully more than one. But he never complained. He just just had a great attitude, and he just you know never you know you had the New York comedians, Frank. You remember been around, yeah, you, could, yeah. you know you know I, well if I had more runs, I'd be this. And he never once did that. I mean, you you could tell that in, in his personality early on too. Uh, absolutely. You, well, you also have to know his family. I mean, it's the family he's from as well. His his dad is a tremendous human being. He was he followed him his whole career. Every start in you know in, in the South Atlantic League, his dad was able to get to and watch. I, I mean, they're very close to family. I mean, his wife and kids now. I mean, he did it right. He's done it right. He understands 
what it is to be a professional, not like a lot of today's kids, you know, in, in the game. He understands that there are guys out there that he needs and that need, that, that need him. And when you work together, people are going to respect the heck out of you. And, you know, if you could treat, could critique the way he pitches, you could live with that. But the respect you get as a player is when they treat you like a human being more, you know, first and foremost, you don't see any of the back page stories and stuff like that because you don't put yourself in those positions. No, Frank, let me hop around a little bit. So we, you're with the Twins, yeah, in, in 1987, MVP in the World Series, win game seven. In 88, you win the Cy Young. But then in, in 89, you're, you're traded to the Mets. Uh, was that a surprise to you to, after the success you had in Minnesota just recently before then? I would like to say yes, but not really because the fact that uh, uh, the way it played out, I had a contract situation and uh, I said a couple of things I shouldn't have said to the media, you know, say, stating that maybe I need to be someplace else to play and the Midwestern people don't like that. You know, so ultimately I found out afterwards, I met with Andy McPhail when I did the one year of ESPN back in 2003, and we sat down and finally cleared the air as to why I got traded, how I got traded, he explained the whole scenario to me. I was not supposed to be a New York Met, Jay. I was supposed to be a New York Yankee. Really? If you remember, if you remember correctly, the reason why I became a Met was because Doc got hurt. Right. And, and they, they, all of a sudden, the Mets included a couple more pitchers that – put the trade over the top for me to go with the Mets. So it ended up being, as, as you know, a five for one, five for two trade. Uh, Aguilera, Tappany, and West were the keys for the Mets, uh, for the Twins, and they helped them to the 91 World Series. So they did their job. And, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I'm sure the Mets and the Mets fans hoped that I was the answer to, you know, at least wait until Doc gets back and then being able to partner with Doc and Coney and Sid and Ronnie and all those guys to put the team back into a championship, which we never did. And, you know, growing up a Mets fan, and watching the 69 team win it and watch the 73 team get to the World Series and then watching the 86 team, incredible story. The only thing I regret about my time as a Met was that we had such a good team on paper that we had no right not making the playoffs. But for some reason, and you could probably back this, and I'll be careful how I say this, but for some reason, personalities, between the white lines, when personalities don't click, you don't win. Yeah, no, as much, I, as I, much talent as you have, you don't win. And we Yeah, I, I mean, but, but backtrack one second. How much of a thrill it was for you to win the seventh game of a World Series? That's got to be a special thrill, you know, the seventh game of many series. But, you know, you know, get to win against the Cardinals in that year. Every kid dreams about taking a ball, not only winning the World Series, but taking a ball for a game seven. I mean, that's what you dream when you, when you play, when you put a baseball in your hand when you're a kid. And then to win game seven, I mean, I, I, that's something I could brag about the rest of my life. But, the, 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 you know, looking and talking to you today, Jay, in my 15-year career, this is the only time I made the playoffs. So it was that much more special knowing that the one time we, I, you know, I made the playoffs, was able to win the championship and have that ring to show for it. But, but you know, how much, you know, born in the Long Island kid, how much pressure did you feel, like you said, coming over to Mets uh, in a five-for-one trade? I mean, that's a lot of pressure on a young local kid. You know, he's probably expecting to win every start you, know, you made that year. I did too. But it, it, that doesn't happen. You know, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. You know, when, when things were good, they were great. When I struggled, especially in my last year, my last half of the year there, when uh, in 91, it pretty much kicked me out of town. And it doesn't matter if you're a hometown boy. If you don't go out and perform, you're going to be treated just like anybody else. And I heard the boo birds. And, but you know what? They booed me for the right reasons because I wasn't doing my job. And, you know, I didn't do it on purpose. It just so happened. But – at least I could live with that. The, the, the New York fans never treated poor, me poorly. My family never had any hard times coming to the ballpark and enjoying the game. Uh, it, it was just a pleasure, as I said, except for not winning. It was a pleasure putting that uniform on and then being able to come back and coach those guys for the eight years. So I have nothing but great things and great memories with the Mets. But Frank, you know, in 90, you, do, you became the second Mets lefty to win 20 games. You won 20 games that year with, with the great Jerry Kuzman. I mean, that had to be some factor to win 20 the, the one year you did. And the teams were not bad. I mean, in your first year, I think we were 12 games over 500. Right. And the second, that's the year that Davey got fired in 90. It was 91 and 71. So it wasn't like they were really bad teams. It just didn't, you know, just fell short at the end. Yeah, Pittsburgh, you know, Leland and Bonds and uh, Benia and Drebeck, those guys, they just played really well in 91, in yeah, 90. So, yes, I agree. We were okay, but we still – I, I still think we had the better team on paper. But, uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, 
you know, to win 20 games is always special. And to the way I did it, you know, I, I got to 19 wins so quick. And then there was like three or four games that I just didn't, I couldn't win the 20th. And it came down to the last game of the season. And we were already out of the pennant race. And I was going to give the ball to a young kid. And Johnny and Ron, of all people, looked at me and said, are you crazy? You have a chance for 20 wins. Be greedy a little bit. You know, give yourself a chance to go into history books. Because I think at that time, after winning that game, I became the 18th guy in the history of baseball to win 20 games in both leagues. So, right. you know, after everything was said and done, I appreciate them pushing me to go out there and, and, and win that 20th. And I appreciate the team going out there and doing it. And the funny thing, Jay, and you, you'll remember this, to loosen me up, because I was so uptight for that last game of the year, to loosen me up, if you remember, in my warm-ups, in the first inning, I, I'm throwing my pitches, and all of a sudden, the umpire, home plate umpire starts laughing. I'm like, what the hell are you laughing at? <laughs> and he went like this. So I take my hat off. You remember the shaving cream on top of my head? Yes, 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 yeah, yes. They put the shaving cream on to loosen me up so I can go out there and have some fun, and I proceeded to go out there for seven innings and get the win. You don't think Franco did that, do you, Johnny? Oh, no, I'm not the one. How about you want a John Franco story real quick? Uh, you know, Davey was great as far as letting the starting pitcher go home on the road the night before if you're pitching, you know, uh, in another city. So I was in Houston. They let me go home because I was pitching the next night at Shea. And I get back home and I turn the TV on when I got home to watch the Met game. And all of a sudden, the, the, the TV pans into the dugout at the Astrodome. And there's a makeshift Frank Viola. In, 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 they had me dressed up in a doll, sitting <laughs> in the dugout watching the game. And I had, and Franco's got his arm around me. It was like, you know, just That's typical just, Johnny. Take, you know how long that took him to probably put that together just for the that was that, that was him. Hey, Frank, tell the people what you do. You're a, you're, you tell me the other day, your first time you're able to work and live at home now. You live in, was in Mooresville, North Carolina, you're yes. at now. And you're yeah, going to be the coach for uh, the High Point Rockets? High Point Rockers, yeah, in the Atlantic yeah. League. You know, they, they came to fruition after I left the Mets in 2018. Now, I, I, I was still looking to work, and I, I really wanted to make a difference with the kids today. And uh, the affiliate ball started changing with the analytics and their thought process on coaches and stuff like that. And my age started to come to play. And I just looked around, and the High Point Rockers were in the Atlantic League with the Long Island Ducks with Wally. And uh, they came, it was an expansion team. And as you know now, the Atlantic League that I'm in is working with, as, uh, with, the ma with Major League Baseball. So we're working together in certain aspects. But uh, I got the job as pitching coach, and uh, it's 40 minutes from my house. So it's the first time in my career I'm living at home, working at a place that I enjoy, and it's baseball still, and I'm still married. So I got it all down. I got it, Jay. Frank, you hear you're a big NASCAR fan, right? <laughs> NASCAR, I am in NASCAR heaven right now. Kyle Busch's, Kyle Busch's place is up the road. Uh, Penske's place, Dale Earnhardt, uh, uh, Dale Earnhardt, uh, yeah, Dale, Dale Earnhardt Jr. doesn't live too far away from me. I became friends with Denny Hamlin a little bit over the last couple of years through golf and Michael Waltrip. But it's so funny because those guys with their accents are looking at me going, how in the hell is a New Yorker? Did you come down here to live? They don't even understand what I'm saying half the time. I don't get it, Jay. Well, I, I understand it very well, Frank. Frank, Thank you know, you know uh, 2014, how scare you, you have open heart surgery. You've been doing great. I love your videos. You're walking all the time, trying to stay healthy. I mean, how's your health now, Frank? Thank, uh, thanks for asking, Jay. Everything's good. You know, I've lost, uh, since this crazy time, since the pandemic, I've actually lost 25 more pounds, so I'm feeling really good. Uh, Kathy and I, that's our, that's our quality of time together. We walk an hour, hour and a half every day to stay in shape. And, um, you know, that 2014 year as a whole, Jay, I lost my mom and dad within 23 days. And then a month later, I have open heart surgery. So that was a rough year. But you know what? When I had the open heart surgery, I knew I was going to be okay because mom and dad would tell me, you know what? It's way too soon to see us again. Enjoy life a little bit more. So I have done that every day, and it's you know looking at you as ugly as you are. It's, I know what it is. Still, it's still the greatest thing in the world to be able uh, to talk to you, Jay. I got to tell you one one last St. John's story before we leave you, and we just talked about it before. I was at work at Fairly Dickinson in the SID. We played a doubleheader at your place, and I was like, I thought it was a Connie Mack with a suit on the bed. So I was yelling at the Empire, and uh, Bill Bill Hood's a big early guy threw me out of the game and Frank has never let me forget that he said he's just telling me who is that kind of off, off, creepy looking guy who 
<laughs> wasn't a bad t- until I got to Mets. He realized that was me. Oh, but, that's awesome. Uh, that uh, was that was a good good time. Hey, Frank, with, with, great. With, with that voice getting agitated, Jay, I'd probably throw your ass out of the game. I too, got you know? thrown out of the game. But it was <laughs> the first time either. It wasn't the first time either. Hey, Frank, it's great reminiscing with you. I'm glad you're doing well. You're a good friend, and uh, you know. And every time I speak to Lou Carnesec, I always ask about you and Johnny and Lou. And I have his 95th birthday the other day. He was a great man. A great amazing man. Amazing him and him and Jack Kaiser both. I mean, you talk yeah. about two wonderful, wonderful human beings. There you have it. Yeah, they were great, man. Frankie, you're good people, man, and I hope I get to see you soon. And tell Kathy I said hi, and you know all the best. And thank you for giving us a couple of minutes. Uh, always great talking to you, Jay. You take care as well. Yeah. De- Devin, we're good.